so let me tell you a little bit about Blake. Blake is a three-time self-published author and the founder of EverydayHDR.com and HDRinsider.com. He has recently also developed ZoneEdit.com, a site devoted to his Photoshop post-processing technique that utilizes the limitless potential of the zone system and the power of Photoshop to capitalize on the contrast in any image. So with that, I will turn the screen over to Blake. All right. <clears throat> okay. How are we looking here? I can, let me see. I see your screen. Excellent. Okay, before we start off, as always, I have to thank Darcy and the folks at Topaz Labs that allow us to do this. This is uh, an absolutely incredible learning environment, and I know I have grown through um, helping others uh, as well. So it's just a great place for us to convene and learn together. So the title of this course is Forging Your Photographs, and that's not like when you were a kid and you're forging your parents' signatures so that you could um, get out of school for the day. What I'm talking about is like blood, sweat, and tears, um, hammer to the anvil, forging a photograph. And what I mean is that you have to have good raw materials to start in order to get that, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have to have the best equipment. So this photograph that you're looking at is a raw file from the Sony A6000. It's my new kind of walk around camera that uh, doesn't replace my Canon 60, but it's one of those that um, it's very small, so I can take it anywhere. It's 24 megapixels, great raw images. But this was a kit lens on a Sony A6000. So I'm not working with my uh, Canon 60 with my 17 to 40 um, L series lenses. This is just a, a it's a, it's a great above a point and shoot. It's called an ILC camera. But the point is that as long as you start with a good source image, a good image that uh, has a good exposure to it um, that allows you to do some working with and that you're working in a raw file. So this whole analogy with forging your images and good raw materials is if you're working with a JPEG and you're trying to do what I'm going to do to this photograph, it will more than likely uh, make it look bad. Or if you were to use poor raw materials when you started forging a sword, you're more than likely going to break that metal. Same thing. You want to start with good quality source images to forge the image. So what I'm going to do here is kind of like a smart object workflow too, um, to show you that Topaz uh, products can be used in a smart object workflow. So the first thing I need to do with this image, oh, this image was also taken at the National Harbor in Baltimore. Uh, I just went there. I lived on the East Coast for like 13 years, but this is the first time I went there when I went home for vacation. So it's pretty cool to see this. So if you live in that area, you know, big, big shout out to Baltimore, Blue Crabs. All right. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and, and command or control J to duplicate this background layer. Now, in order to make this a smart object, what I need to do is right click on that layer and go to convert to smart object. So all that does, um, anytime you say smart in Photoshop, you're already thinking, well, duh, I'm, you know, I'm dumb. I don't know what I'm doing in Photoshop. Now you're talking about a smart object. Um, so what you're doing in Photoshop when you're telling it to turn a layer into a smart object is you're telling it to remember everything that you do to that layer as far as filters are concerned. So you may have done this in the past where you make a topaz adjustment and then later on you say, oh man, I wish I could go back and correct all that stuff that I did. And you can't unless you go all the way back in the history palette, maybe duplicate the layer and all this complicated stuff just to get back to that one process you're at where if you make it a smart object, knowing that you're going to use, like what I'm going to do today, adjust clarity, denoise, and detail in particular on this image. So now this is a smart object. I also want to say this is not a HDR image. I'm going to try and make it a pseudo HDR image. I don't even really even like that word pseudo HDR because if you increase the dynamic range, you're increasing the dynamic range. Uh, so we're going to make this an HDR image from a single raw file. So I'm going to go to filter and I'm going to go to topaz and I'm going to go to adjust. So adjust is going to be the meat and the potatoes for me as far as getting that HDR style look. 
And the key to this is I'm not going to use any presets on the left hand side. What I'm going to do is only open adaptive exposure. Now the workflow that I'm going to do for, for adjust clarity, denoise, and detail is all leading me up to the point that I'm getting a good baseline image so that these techniques can pretty much be used on many different photos to get a decent look. And because they're going to be on a smart object, and because I'm giving you the action at the end, everyone says, yay, free stuff. Um, you can use this on your images later. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is is increase the adaptive exposure. And you can see that when I increase the adaptive exposure, it starts to give us that HDR look that we want to achieve. If I go too high though, it makes our sky black. We really start to see a lot of the noise that we're taking this raw image too far. We're taking our raw materials too far. We're beating it too much with the hammer. So we need to bring that down a little bit so we don't ruin the integrity of the material that we're working with. So I'm going to bring that down to about 0.42-ish. That looks about good. What I'm really doing here, what I'm looking at when I look at this photograph, when I say what it, the the size or the, the adjustment that I'm going for is if I go this high, I start to see all this dark blue that happens up here. Well, I know all this stuff I can just mask out later, but the effect that I want is on the clouds. I don't want them to get that dark. It, they, those clouds weren't that dark to begin with. A lot of people ask me, how do I fix dark, nasty clouds in Photoshop from the HDR? Our process well my answer is usually don't take it that far in your tone mapping process and you won't have to worry about it because a lot of times what they're confusing themselves with is when I take it up this high I like the contrast I'm getting in between each individual cloud but it's making the rest of it dark well if that's the case it's probably because uh, you can use other tools like Topaz Detail or Topaz Clarity to bring out the richness in those clouds without going too far right off the bat so it's all baby steps when you're, when you're, I've never forged a sword before. I tried to in my sculpture class and, and then I got caught and I got in trouble. Uh, but when you're, when you're forging with metal and you try to work too fast, too quick, you end up destroying the material. So you have to work pretty slow in the process. So we'll bring that up. We'll go to our regions next. Now the regions, if you can imagine this image right now, if I go down to one region, it's the entire image that this adaptive exposure is working off of. Now, if I move this up to seven, or let's say four, it's a little bit easier on the math side. This is going to divide my image into four equal quadrants, and that's what the adaptive exposure is going to be working on. What I like to do is actually bring the regions up a little bit so that all that area that the adaptive exposure is working on is spread out through very small regions throughout the photograph rather than over the entire photograph as a whole. That's going to help you get that tone mapped HDR look. So we're trying to get the baseline image right now. We aren't trying to get a perfect HDR photograph, so don't get that in your head. So with the contrast here, the farther I move it to the right, the more contrast I'm getting between my lights and my darks. The more I move it to the left, the more I get that HDR effect. Now that's a little too much at the negative four realm, but let's say we go like the negative point eight or maybe 0.6 realm, it starts to look a little bit better around there. So what my goal is here is basically getting enough dynamic range out of this photograph using the hard hitting tools that we've got in Topaz Adjust so that when I move into clarity and detail, I can really start to fine tune those areas. Now I'm not working with color right now. What I'm doing with adjust denoise and detail and clarity is really just working on the contrast within the image. Now, when I'm working with my systems, well, I'm just going to go ahead and press OK. I'm not going to do anything with details because with the detail adjustment, I'm going to do that in Topaz detail, not here in the adjustment. So I'm going to press OK. So typically how I work with my systems is I go in really hard in the front with the tone control of the digital zone system and then I start cleaning it all up with the color control that I get in the color zone system. So this is kind of emulating that same process. Now notice over here in that smart filter area, you notice how now it has Topaz Adjust 5 under here. What I can do is at any time I could double click that Topaz Adjust 5 and it'll open up Topaz Adjust. So at any time in the workflow, even after doing clarity, denoise, and detail, I can always go back and look at that. The other beauty of it is, is that let's say I don't want to see what happens with Topaz Adjust on there. I can just take that eyeball off, off, off. I can take that eyeball off, and now we have just what the original image was without any of our smart object filters on it. So if I put the eyeball back on there, just know that it still has to go back through Topaz Adjust and run that process over again. As you stack these 
and you go to the bottom of the stack, you turn the eyeball off or you make an adjustment, it has to reassess the entire stack. So while it can be very helpful in the workflow, it can also be a very slow process. That's why with smart filters, I, I don't say I tend to stay away from them. I just tend to use them a lot less than, um, than I'd like to. So in the Topaz, Clarity is the next one. With clarity, what I want to do is further uh, exaggerate the, the contrast in the image. Now, if you're familiar with HDR processing and you're familiar with a lot of what I teach, I teach a lot about um, the HDR tone mapping process, and I spend a lot of time in photomatics. So if you look at this, you've got micro contrast, low contrast, high contrast, and medium contrast here. There's a micro contrast slider in photomatics. And a lot of people use that micro contrast slider during their HDR tone mapping, and there's not a problem with that. But look what you get here in Clarity. You now have four different ways to adjust the contrast in your image. And on the lower contrast ends, the smaller detail contrast, you get basically two, two and a half, because the medium contrast is kind of uh, clumped up in there too. So this is what I really like about Topaz Clarity is that I can get into those really finite details in my image and those really contrasty spots and really exaggerate them and bring them out. Now, look what happens when I move the, the small, con the micro contrast up or those smaller contrast areas. Look what's happening in these clouds. Now, what I'm going to tell you is don't worry about what's happening to the blue in this image right now. Th these blue areas, I know you're probably cringing saying, but like, why are you even doing that? That's not what you teach. And you're right, it's not. But I'm going to take it up there and I'm going to show you what I do with that later. So I'm going to take these this micro contrast up. Please remember, don't look at the blue stuff right now. The blue stuff looks bad. Okay. So the micro contrast, as I bring that up, it really starts to bring out the volume that was in those clouds. Now I know that when I was at the scene that they did not look like this. There was a lot of volume in those clouds. There were pits, there were cracks, there were crevices. I could see it, my eye could see it, but my camera has a problem with it. It saw it, it clearly saw it because look, that information is there. It just can't show me on one image. That's my job to forge that image, pull that stuff out and get every piece out of that raw material that I can. All right, so I'm gonna move that micro contrast up. I'm gonna move it up pretty high. I'm gonna go to about 0.75-ish, that area the low contrast. This is pretty neat about low contrast is that what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this low contrast up pretty high and then I want to show you something. So you see the clouds here are really blown out when I move that low contrast up really high. And sometimes you like the look of what the rest of what's happening in the rest of the image but you don't like how blown out those clouds are. Well that's why there's a white point and black point slider here even a mid-tone slider too. So if you notice that your whites are really blowing out Let's look at our histogram here. When you notice that your whites are really blown out and they're pushing really far to the edge of that histogram, you can just come here to the white level and bring that down. And as you bring that down, it's going to pull it away from that blown out area. Now, at the same time, it's pushing the whole histogram to the left. So I'm going to ask you a question. You can just answer this at your desk. If it's pushing it farther to the left, what's it doing? It's making our blacks clipping clip over on that far left side. So now we need to readdress that issue and move the blacks over so that it moves our histogram farther to the right. So you notice when you look at these black levels and these white levels and you look at the histogram, if you move the black level to the right, you're going to push the histogram to the right. If you move the white level to the left, you're going to push the histogram to the left. So it keeps all of your, you can keep your, uh, your contrast at bay when you use those white point and black point adjustments in conjunction with the medium, low, high, and micro contrast in the photo. So now, with the medium contrast, if we move that up, we might start to see some more blowing out with those highlights and those white levels, and we can go ahead and move that, that, that down to push it farther to the left, but again, it's going to push our, our image over. So you constantly need to adjust those. If you want that look from that kind of contrast, then you need to adjust those white and black levels to keep your histogram at, at bay. Now, a lot of times the histogram is, is just data, and I say this a lot, but let data be data. And data can tell you a lot of different things, but your artistic eye is going to tell you what you need to know. So there's the histogram. We know what the histogram can do, what it's capable of, and what it's capable of showing us, but we also have to keep in mind what our artistic expression is going to be in this photo. I don't want my, my media 
medium contrast that high up. So I'm going to just bring that down. And I'm also going to bring my, my black point and my white point over a little bit to keep that where it was. I'm probably going to pull my low contrast down a little bit too. And then we have our high contrast. And our high contrast gives us those bigger areas of contrast, especially you can see it up here in the clouds and on these edges. Now I can probably try and fix the nastiness in the clouds up there by moving my high contrast down. But I've got a better way to fix that. I'm not worried about it here. I'm just going to go ahead and zero this out. Now, if you know uh, some of the stuff that I've done in past training with Clarity, I've done some YouTube videos on it. I've done, I always show Clarity in every one of my webinars because I think Clarity is one of the most important programs that Topaz has ever, ever made because of its ability, especially for HDR photographers like myself, to really rescue the contrast in an image. But what it also has is it's got these awesome hue saturation adjustment um, layers in here as well. So I can readdress the colors in my image based off of the hue saturation here. I'm not going to go too far into color right now. I just want to make you make sure you're aware that I would usually hit into this uh, hue saturation area. The reason why I'm not going to color right now is because I really am focusing on tone first, and then I'll worry about color later. So I'm going to press OK and let Topaz Clarity work its magic. Um, one of the things that we've done now as we've created this image, if I go ahead and zoom in here, and we look at the image all over. During my, um, my, my topaz tone mapping process, if you want to call it that, what I've brought out here is a lot of noise. And not just noise in the clouds, uh, and not just noise in the big blue sky, it's really bad up here, but also noise in these clouds. And I want to fix that. So, of course, what I can do is go to Filter, Topaz Labs and Denoise. Now there are a lot of powerful noise reduction software out there. Now even what's in Adobe Camera Raw and Lightroom, they are very powerful when it comes to noise removal. But one of the things that I always come to when I come into uh, Topaz Denoise is that the results that I get from it in my workflow, directly in my workflow, not before my workflow starts, not after my workflow, but in my workflow, um, what it allows me to do is if I go too overboard with something, it allows me to kind of rescue that noise that I may have created during the process, and it does it without affecting the detail in the image too much. So I'll leave this at 100%. I'm going to go over here to the uh, Ferris wheel. This is a pretty high-tech looking Ferris wheel here. So when I go to, uh, usually where I start is JPEG moderate, and I see what JPEG moderate does for my image. Now when I look at this, I have not lost any detail in the bars in between the Ferris wheel. I've not lost any detail in what's going on in the harbor here. All I've done is smoothed out a lot of the uh, cloud area that's starting to get noisy. Now, watch what happens when I hit JPEG strong. I'm smoothing out that noise even more, and I'm losing even, I'm not, even in the bars, I'm not losing a whole lot of detail. Like right here, I might have a little bit of detail loss, but it's not a whole lot of detail. So I can just go to this overall strength, drop that down just a little bit, and resurrect what's happening in those bars. So I'm, I'm reducing the noise in the image, but it's smart enough to know that I'm reducing the noise based on... Um, noise pixels. And the way that, that Topaz Denoise maps uh, your noise reduction is absolutely incredible. Most software kind of takes the noise and just blurs it together, but the way the algorithm works in Denoise is it takes a spot, it recognizes the noise that's around that spot, and then it samples another spot, looks at the noise that's similar to that noise, and helps that noise get reduced in a uh, in a way that it's not really blurring the image, it's just finding like pixels and blending them together. It's very powerful. It's extremely powerful. That's why I like to use denoise in my workflow. I mean, when you look at the at the boats here, uh, I can still see the lines in the, in the bottom of that boat. Um, now, look at the water. I can still see the crisp detail in the water, but I'm reducing the noise at the same time. So I'm just going to go ahead and press OK on that one and watch my noise get reduced. And as you see over here at this smart filter, over here you're going to see that we've got Topaz Clarity, we've got Adjust, and now we're going to get another one for Denoise. All right, so the next program I want to jump into is Topaz Detail. Let's just see, just for, for grins, let's look at where we are for now. So here's where we started, and here's where we are now. So if you don't think that there's a difference um, you might want to look again. There's a pretty big difference there. Um, so we're going to go ahead and go to Filter, 
Topaz Labs, and then go to Detail. Now, what I also want to reiterate, though, or I guess say for the first time, is that what I'm doing here is making very subtle changes. They, they don't look really hard and, and really fast, like I said in the beginning of this. I'm not trying to get just one one really quick answer to the solution. You know, it's a build-up process. It's a forging process. It's a tempering process. It takes time. It doesn't. When you get good with it, and when you start to get efficient with it, it happens a lot quicker. So I've even heard people say, "Well, you know, if it takes me longer than 10 minutes, it's taken me too long, or maybe I've done something wrong with my photo if it's taken longer than 10 minutes." I feel the opposite about that. I feel like if I haven't taken 10 minutes, I feel like I haven't given a good image. The, the justice that it deserves to make it and push it to that next level and, and really make it a, you know, a nice fine art piece of work. But again, that's kind of my stance on, on how I operate with my images. And you get really fast, really quick at it once you really start to dive into uh, what you're doing with these programs. So I'm going to go in and just make this 100% here so we can look at uh, what Topaz Detail is going to do. So Topaz Detail is kind of like the sharpener. So what I did with the denoise is I kind of smoothed everything out, got rid of the noise, and in the process I kind of made some some hard edges around uh, some of the detail in the images. And that's where Topaz Detail comes in because it can do it wonders on resurrecting detail, and especially in those smaller areas. So when I move those small details up, you can see just how detailed we can get there. Now if I move it too far, you can see that even those areas that Topaz denoise couldn't quite reduce all the noise on because it's uh, not 100% uh, uh, foolproof. There's still some uh, some artifacting that's happening there. So I don't want to go that high. You should never really go that high with the small details anyway. With the small details, I tend to only go up to about 0.3. The small details I work with faster and a little bit uh, a little bit harder than the rest of them. So let me zoom in even closer here. Let's look at this the Ferris wheel here for a second, and let's look at the original. So in the original, we can almost see that there's some beads here. It almost looks like just a bunch of round circles. But then once we get into that small detail, we can see that those are like almost like little little beaded areas in, in that wheel. All the bars here, we've also resurrected a lot of detail in the bars. We're starting to resurrect some detail here in the windows of the, the closed Ferris wheel. So one of the things with the small details, when it comes to any detail boosting that I do in detail, I typically bring the detail up and then drop the detail boost a little bit to smooth off the detailing that I've done. If I bring the detail boost up, you can see that it really does boost the detail, but it comes with the sacrifice of, of a lot of noise. So if I come zoom out a little bit here so you can see what the 100% looks like, that detail boost is, is pretty bad. And I get some really awesome detail in that Ferris wheel, but uh, what I'm looking for is more something like that where it doesn't exploit the noise, the small details within the noise. Because when you're boosting the small details, you have to think about, what could get confused with detail. And what gets confused with detail is noise. So if you have these artifacted noise areas and you bring your small details all the way up, well, you're just now uh, making that noise even uh, even noisier. So you have to be kind of careful with how, how far you take those. So there's the before and after. Let's go ahead and, and boost our medium details up a little bit. So the medium details are going to get a little bit larger than the small details. It's kind of like uh, the size of, of drinks, I guess, if you were to get a small, medium, or large. If you can kind of look at the sizes and notice that as you move those sliders up, the, the area that they cover gets incrementally larger. So the area that, that's covered in the med medium details is more like the, the dark areas that we're seeing in the clouds. Okay, so we'll bring that down a little bit because that's a little bit too far. Same thing. When I bring the medium details up, I want to bring the boost down a little bit to smooth that out. I'm, get, I'm still getting a detail boost in the image, if you want to call it that, but I'm not using the boosting sliders to do it. I'm using those boost sliders to kind of round it out. If you bring the 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 medium detail boost all the way down, it kind of gives it almost a diffusion effect, like a soft edge effect around that detail. So that's kind of where we're going with that. If we drop the small details all the way down, you can see the same kind of effect there. It just starts to smooth things out. Now, if you're going for like a smooth painted look, drop those details down. You can bring this one all the way up and bring the boost all the way down, and you kind of get this uh, almost painterly look to the image, which might help when you're bringing it into something like Topaz Impression. I'm not going to do that, though, for this. We'll just go ahead and bring that up a little bit. Okay, there's good. Now, the large details, the same thing. Let's zoom out just to 50% and look at what happens to the large details. So the small details cover what was kind of in these little clouds here. So if we bring the large details up, you can see that it 
grabs a big chunk of area in those clouds. So I'll just bring that up a slight bit and bring that down. Now, what I want to clue you in on here is that you see there are not just the overall detail, you also have shadow detail and highlight detail. So let's click shadow detail and let's zoom in to the boat windows here. Now the boat windows are, are black, but they do have some detail in there. So if we bring up the small details in the windows, you can see we're starting to bring out some detail in those windows that we may not have seen before. All right, bring up the, the boost a little bit there. Actually bring that up a little bit. And then the medium details, we're starting to really kind of get that reflection off of those windows, especially down here. And then the large details within the actual detail of the, uh, the shadow areas. Now, if we, if we go ahead and turn off the original, you'll see that we get a lot more detail in both the Ferris wheel and the windows of the boat. And this all helps kind of give you that feel of uh, being there at this place. So I'm gonna press okay on this. So if we look here, let's look at our before and after. There's the before and there's the after. Now, like I said before, I'm trying to get a roundabout look for my image. I'm not trying to get the full image yet. I'm just trying to get um, the, let's, I guess, the overall shape of the sword as I'm fo forging it, but I'm not trying to put the edge on it yet. This is where you can start putting the edge on it. So if I go right here in the smart filter, you can see that there's a mask here. So if I click on that mask, I can now paint in black or white on that mask to push or pull things away. So if I paint here along these cloud edges, I start to clean up those edges around those clouds that are starting to get pretty dingy. Now I'm going to go pretty hard on this one and, and just paint with black really, really deep in there so that we get the, what I'm using is a Wacom tablet and a Wacom tablet has, um, pressure sensitivity. So if we look at the mask here, let me just go ahead and press Alt on that mask so you can see what I'm doing here. If I press really light, you see that the, uh, it should be doing that. Uh, usually there's a pressure sensitivity here. <laughs> of course, it's trying to prove me wrong. Okay, so usually if you paint with a Wacom tablet, mine's not working appropriately right now, what it does is it let me see if that, that's the button I'm looking for. Nope, that's not the button I'm looking for either. Okay, so usually if you click up here and you have the flow and the opacity of your brush, the flow and your opacity of your brush will change based on the pressure sensitivity that you're putting down on your Wacom tablet. So what I was trying to do is actually go a lighter gray on these clouds. And a lot of people, they get caught up between either painting white or painting black. But check this out. If you don't have a Wacom tablet, just change your brush to a lighter gray. All right, so the now when we click on our image and we paint with that lighter gray on those areas, it's not going to take them away as fast because I'm painting there in gray. If I were to paint in black, you'll see that it takes them away completely. But I kind of like how we've got some depth and some volume to those clouds, so I'm going to paint in that depth and volume to those clouds. And again, go back to a gray brush and paint with a gray brush on a mask, which is essentially the same thing as using a very light pressure sensitivity on a Wacom tablet. I can start to uh, push some of those cloud area back, but I like how this area is kind of dark here because it helps bring our eye to that Ferris wheel, so I'm going to leave that the way it is. So now let's look at our before and after. So we're, we're still crafting, we're fine tuning. Um, it seems like I have a halo here on this part because of the way my brush went. I'm gonna go ahead and paint that out real quick. Right here, okay. All right. It's nice soft edge brushes here. I don't use any hard edge brushes. If you use a hard edge brush, you're gonna get like a, a streak path. I'll show you. If you use a hard edge brush like this one and you paint, See how it's like a nasty streak? Yeah, we don't like that. So always use a nice soft brush when you're masking like that. Another thing with masking is that with a mask, you can even use a uh, filter on a mask. So if we blur the mask and we do a Gaussian blur on the mask, what we can do is kind of blur the, uh, the black and the gray together. Sometimes you have to go really high on your pixel count to do that. See how they're kind of blurring together to, to make a more soft edge there. So that's something that we, we need to think about too. That some, we can treat masks a lot like we treat our images as well. So now we've got a nice uh, overall HDR look. 
But I told you about color before, and if you look at this image, we have uh, a very blue color temperature. Uh, there's many ways that you can fix a blue color temperature, but one of my favorite ways is to make a stamp of the entire progress. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm taking this layer one, I'm sandwiching it all down, but putting it above everything else. So if I turn my fingers into a crazy, um, I don't know, like Chinese finger trap by pressing Control, Shift, Alt, and E, or Command, Option, Shift, and E on a Mac, you'll notice that I now have a new layer. That new layer that was formed is a stamp of all of the visible layers in your layers palette. So what that allows me to do is if I want to do any editing on this layer, it won't affect anything underneath. So not only are we working extremely non-destructively with the smart object, we're now even getting more non-destructive by making that stamp layer above. So what I'd like to do to get my color temperature even, now this is a uh, if you, in my color zone system training package, I talk a lot about color theory. And color theory is an amazing thing even for photographers to understand because if we know what the complementary concepts are, where you take an images, a color's complement, and you apply it to the overall look of the color, you can subdue that color. So in painting, if I was painting with a blue, and it was a really saturated blue, and I wanted to tone down that blue a little bit so it's not so poignant, so saturated, I would add a little bit of yellow to it, uh, actually orange in the painting world because that's the opposite, but in the digital world it would be yellow. Add a little bit of yellow to it so that it kind of evens out everything. But if you look at the overall image, how do we know what the average color would be for the entire photo? It's kind of hard to tell because we have blue, we have some green down here, we have some black, we have some white, we have some uh, brown over here. So if I go to filter and go to blur and go to average, that's going to give me the average color of this entire image. So that's basically telling me that the overall color temperature of this entire photograph is this pale baby blue. All right. Now, I want the opposite of that because complements are opposite each other on the color wheel. So if I press control I or command I, that will invert that. Now when I press soft light, it's going to apply like an automated color temperature fixer. I guess that's my technical term for that. So here we have a nice blue image. Here we've got an evened out, it's got a nice even transition between colors. So it's not so blue because how do we subdue that blue? we use its complementary color. So that's what I've done here. I've used the complement to change that. Now, if you're wondering how on earth am I gonna remember that, you don't really have to because if you go to the website afterwards, you'll see the actions here. In the actions, forging your photos, you have the temperature level. So if I go ahead and delete this layer and press play on that layer, oh, there it is. And it's even gonna come up and say this action will attempt to even out the light temperature. By default, it's at 75% opacity at soft light. Okay, but if you wanted to change that to the taste, you could drop the opacity or increase the opacity depending on how you want the temperature of your image to look. So it's already done for you. You've got an action for it. You don't have to worry about remembering that. Just remember, if you want to subdue a color that's too bright or something's too ha happening too much with too set too saturated, you can subdue it with its complement. So now that I've got my color temperature nice and fixed, I've got my tone nice and fixed. Let's take a quick before and after. Oh boy, now we're, we have something we can start telling our neighbors about. What I'm going to do is press again, make another stamp, and go Control, Shift, Alt, and E, or Command, Option, Shift, and E, and make another stamp. Now you see, as I'm working on this image, I'm not flattening things, I'm making stamps so that I can progress forward. What I want to do is show you another way that you can use Topaz Impression to um, Use it as an element within your photo. Recently, I did a YouTube tutorial on how to make a mixed media image. This one, I'm going to show you how you can use it to uh, make water look really, really cool. So I'm going to go to Filter, Topaz Labs, and Topaz Impression. Cross my fingers. OK, Whew, it works. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to the All Effects here. I'm going to go to Impressionistic. What I'm looking for is an artist who did a very good job of painting water in the past. 
that was Monet. Did an awesome job of painting water in the past. We all know Monet's work, right? But look at Monet 2. Look at what it does to that water. It makes it really cool looking. So I'm going to open up the settings for Monet 2. Usually with presets, I don't start with presets. But what I like about Topaz Impression is that it has impeccable presets. And I know Darcy worked really hard on these presets. And she did an amazing job with these presets. So... Um, these presets are a great jumping off point. But what I want to do is with this one in particular is increase the stroke length. So you can see the, basically if you think of yourself as a painter, you're taking those strokes and you're making them long and, and swift. So I'm making those long swift strokes along the water there. And I'm going to increase the brush size a little bit. One thing I'm going to do with the paint opacity is drop it down a little bit. So some of the image underneath starts to show through. So here's the before, here's the after. All right, I'm going to go ahead and press OK. Now, what I have here is a painted image on top of my regular photograph. So we don't need to be afraid of adding a mask. Add that mask. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to press the right next to the right bracket key. I believe that's the backslash key. I'm going to press the backslash key. Right now, you're not going to see anything. But what the backslash key does is it's called a quick mask. And the quick mask is going to show me in red anything, and there's my nasty, nasty hard edge brush. I want a soft edge brush. What that's going to show me is exactly what I'm painting in this image because I only want this to affect the water. So when I'm painting black in that quick mask, say that 15 times fast, it's showing me the area that I am painting out, so the part that I'm taking away from that topaz impression layer. As I start to get closer to the water, I'm going to make my brush size smaller. Now the left bracket key will make your brush smaller. The right bracket key will make your brush bigger. Does it right on the fly. So I'm going to get a little bit smaller in my brush so that I can make some more intricate decisions as I get closer to the water. Okay, And when I take this quick mask off, I turn the quick mask on for a reason because it's like magic. I'm about to bust out in song here, but I'll go ahead and spare you. Okay, so when I turn that quick mask off, mask off by pressing that Q button, look at that. So now we have this nice painted water. And if it's too much, you can just drop the opacity on it a little bit. So we're taking some of the edge off of that water. The reason why I'm doing that is look right now. Right now, the water is competing with the things that are on and around it. And the water, uh, it, it's, it's taking away from the overall image that I'm looking at here. So I'm going to go ahead and drop that opacity to about 50% so that I see about 50% underneath and I have that nice painted look above it. It also kind of emulates what you would get from a neutral density filter. So if you've ever done anything with neutral density filters, it kind of does the same thing. It's a really cool and outside the box way to think about Topaz impression. So that's one of the things that I really like. The last thing I would do on this image to uh, polish it up is a dodge and burn layer. Now, the, the edge of the sword is the most important part to cut through anything you want to cut through. The most important part uh, of the image editing process is going to be dodging and burning because you get to take everything that you already did and refine it and you get to decide what area gets shown more so than the other. So I'm going to make a new layer. I'm going to press shift and F5. That's going to bring in my fill dialog. I'm going to go to 50% gray, change that to soft light, and now you're not going to see any difference. But what this does, it allows me to non-destructively work on my image. So if I press the right bracket key, I can now make my, my brush a little bit larger. I can also change it on the fly by pressing Alt and moving my brush, my, my actual Wacom tablet. Now I get to dodge areas that I don't want to be so bright, or I, that I want to make brighter, I should say. So as I'm dodging, you might not see a big difference here at first, but when I turn that layer on and off, you'll see a difference. Now, if I press Alt or Option, Alt or Option will change me over to the uh, burn tool on the fly. So I can burn out certain areas. I can dodge this area of the water and make it a little bit lighter to really bring that part back. I can dodge this area out to make my eye kind of go more towards all those highlighted areas. Typically, the way our eye works, it's going to find highlights first and then move throughout the image. So now I'm pressing Alt or Option on the fly and burning in these shadows of these boats. One thing that you can do to really accentuate something 
especially lines where lines meet. Now this boat where it meets the water, if I darken this up by, by burning really hard right here underneath the boat, and then I dodge right here on the bottom of the boat, it's going to help bring that boat off of the water. All right, so I'm, I'm burning underneath the boat to make that dark, and I'm dodging above the boat to make that brighter because our eye is going to naturally go towards those highlighted areas. Okay, so I could, I could continue on, but I'll go ahead and, and spare you that one too. But look at the difference there. There's before, there's after. I've targeted areas that I want specifically to be pinpointed. Now, one of the last things I want to show you is kind of that mixed media idea that I was doing with impression. So this would be the jumping off point for me to call this a good image. Okay, so if I turn all these off, there's our before. All right, nothing really to shout about, nothing great. Here's our after. You know, we've really fine-tuned it. We've really set this image off and took what was a snapshot from an A6000, not even a beefed up camera, it was a kit lens, I even hate that lens, but turned it into a really nice uh, photograph that um, you know could, could be print worthy if I took this a little bit further, okay? So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna duplicate this, I'm gonna flatten it all down, I wanna show you something really cool that I discovered the other day with Topaz Impression. So I'm gonna make two copies of this, and actually right here, in the action, I've got the impression sequence. This will do all of this for you also. So what I'm gonna do is on this background layer, I'm gonna go to filter, I'm gonna go to Topaz Labs, I'm gonna go to impression. What I'm gonna do on this layer is I'm gonna create a baseline paint, right? So this is kind of like the underpainting, we'll call it that. And I'm gonna go with this Impasto 2 setting. And I'm gonna press OK, I know I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm gonna do this quick. So now I'm gonna to go to layer one. Now with this layer, before I go into impression, I need to do something. I'm going to go to mode, make sure this is 8 bits per channel, filter, and then I'm going to go to the filter gallery, and I'm going to go to poster edges. Now this is a really cool technique because I, I don't know, maybe Darcy can confirm, but I think I cracked the code here with Topaz Impression. So with the poster edges, I can make the image have these really dark black outlines around certain things. And what that's going to do when I press OK on this, it doesn't look that great now, but when I go to Filter, and go to Topaz Labs, and go to Topaz Impression, all of the brush strokes start to stay in the confines of those black areas. It's really neat, all right? So I'm gonna change that to the Impressionistic and then go to like Syrah, Monet. Let's go to Cezanne. Cezanne, he was pretty cool. Um, click on Cezanne and then press OK. So now what I get here is I get the best of both worlds. I get that nice painted impression look, but then I get this really neat look here too. So what I can do is I can create a mask here and then paint this area out on the mask and it helps if you're not using your dodge tool and that's why I like to have the history palette open because it tells me when I'm being a fool and using the wrong tool and I'm Dr. Seuss and now I'm rhyming. Okay so I can go ahead and paint in black on there and if I sweep by this this Ferris wheel here it's pretty neat almost makes it look like it's in motion just on that top portion there. I can come bring back some of the water here and anything that's that doesn't look right like up here I got this black spike here just go ahead and paint that in paint that in, and now we've created this kind of mixed media or mixed brush stroke kind of painted look, which if here's our before, here's our after. So that's forging that nice painted look in Topaz Impression. So before I start taking questions, what I really want to harp on here is that I don't want you to limit yourself based on the gear that you own because all you need is a good, solid, raw image to push you to that level. You don't need a... a Canon 6D with a 17 to 40 or a 5D Mark III. You know, this was created with a baseline RAW file from an A6000 that's about a fourth of the cost of either of those cameras. So don't get yourself so hard pressed on, I need more gear, I need more gear, I need more gear. Sometimes you just need a better understanding of what you already have. And now I'll open it up for questions. Awesome. That was, I learned a lot of new tricks with this. <laughs> so cool. for questions, let's see what we have. Let's see. Uh, Bill asks, Blake, what kind of raw converter are you working with? ACR or some other converter? 
I use Adobe Camera Raw. Uh, with this image, um, I was really trying to go with the rawest material of the raw file. So the only thing I did was a little bit of chromatic aberration reduction. Not a whole lot because this, this lens actually is pretty good with chromatic aberrations, but I went with um, a very mild chromatic aberration reduction. I straightened the horizon, and that was about all I did with uh, Camera Raw. But usually, I use Camera Raw. That's my main uh, raw converter. I don't do. I don't go to DNG. I just take my raw files and put them right into Adobe Camera Raw. Let's see. Brian asks if you're working on a raw image, why do you start denoise with JPEG moderate instead of raw moderate? Uh, well, I think it's just a matter of the preset, really. When it comes down to that, um, you can use the raw moderate, you can use the JPEG moderate. It doesn't really matter. With that one, uh, typically what I've found is that JPEGs tend to get really noisy, noisier than, say, raw images. And what I did in the process of building this image was I brought out a lot of noise, a lot of noise that I knew was going to need to be reduced quite a bit. Um, and that was all through the process of extracting all that stuff with uh, clarity and adjust. So I, I knew that I was pulling out a lot of noise to begin with, so Topaz Denoise on the JPEG setting uh, was a, a little bit more powerful than, I guess, say the RAW would have been. Gotcha. Yuzet asks, instead of using a gray brush, why not decrease the opacity of a black brush on a mask? Um, I could have just reduced the, the density of that mask too, um, but the problem that I ran into here was um, my the, the opacity on you could you could drop the opacity on the black brush too. You could do that as well. It's essentially the same thing. Uh, reducing the opacity on the brush on a black brush is just going to make if you say reduce it 50%, it's going to give you a 50% gray brush. Essentially, it's the same thing. So I could have reduced the opacity on it. What I did there was uh, something I kind of had to do on the fly because I was hoping my Wacom tablet would work and it didn't. So <laughs> I had to uh, I had to come up with something real quick on the fly. So I just used a gray brush instead of using um, the dropping the opacity. But either way, if you drop the opacity 50%, it's the same thing as using a 50% gray brush. Cool. Um, Harold wants to know how if you could re-show how you turned off the quick mask. Sure. Um, so the quick mask, uh, I wish I could show you a picture on my keyboard right now. Um, I, You know, when it comes to the internet and forward slash and backslashes, I have no idea. And I think I might have said the wrong thing in my last webinar. But anyway, the, the button above the enter button and to the right of the right bracket key and below the backspace button. <laughs> so yeah, I hope that helps. That is, I think it's the backslash. So if you press that backslash key on a mask, it's going to show you the quick mask. And you can just turn that on and off on the fly. I think the Q button does it too. No, that just enters into a quick mask. Um, but yeah, that right bracket key will actually show you what you're masking in red. Or that, that the button next to the right bracket key. It's directly to the right of the right bracket key. I think it's backslash. We can, maybe somebody somebody knows in the, in the comments there. Yeah, let me see. <laughs> Um, Lisa wants to know, if, if you wanted to tone down the yellow in the water, how would you accomplish that? I would probably go to Hawaii. No, I would, <laughs> if, I would open up a hue saturation adjustment layer, and then in that hue saturation adjustment layer right here, there's a finger with two arrows next to it. That's called a targeted adjustment tool. Now, when you click on the targeted adjustment tool and click on any color, it will show you that right here is the yellow. If you look up there, right there is the blue. So if I just click and drag to the left, that'll actually bring down the saturation and all the yellow in the entire image. If I bring it to the right, it looks like uh, ectoplasm, so I won't do that. But if I bring it to the left, it brings it brings down the saturation in the yellow in that water. So that's a way that I could do that. Um, also, I could change the lightness and, and darkness of that too to kind of uh, subdue that black look. I don't want to go monochrome though, so I do want to leave some of that color there. I mean, especially East Coast water is kind of dark. It's like a darkish, uh, not really a blue uh, color. So I would leave that for the sake of the environment that I was in. But if I wanted to be somewhere else, I could go ahead and change the color of the water and the hue. But yeah, I would use a hue saturation adjustment layer. Cool. Um, 
Peter asks, how is the color neutralizing layer created again? The color neutralizer layer is essentially, I'll just go ahead and delete it and so show you again. Basically what that is, is it's, um, it's a clone stamp or it's a, it's a stamp visible layer. So press command, option, shift and E or control shift, alt and E, and that will create a visibly stamped layer that goes above it. So that's basically everything that happened down here. If I turn all this off and then turn this on, it's everything that happened below this. So just so we get everyone on the same playing field here. If you want to get the average color of the entire photo, you go to blur and go to average. And that's going to give us what every color in the entire photo com computed together is. So all the blues, all the yellows, if you smash them all together and mix them up in a pot, this is the color that you would get. And then if we change that to soft light or yeah, soft light here, you can see that it makes our image more blue but I want the opposite because I want to use the complementary color principle. So I'm going to press Command or Control I and that will invert that layer. So that's a way you can do that in Photoshop. But like I said before, right here in the action that you can download on my site, it's 100% free. You don't even have to sign up for anything. All you have to do is go to the website today. It's the first post and press the temperature level after you install it. That will automatically do everything for you. All right. Um... Susan wants to know, how do you get rid of the chromatic aberration in your image? Um, I wish I had a chromatic aberration uh, in the image now. Let me see if I can find one. No, not really. Let me see if the original has any in it. Okay, and now there's not really any chromatic aberration in this image. But what I would usually do is I would usually go into Adobe Camera Raw and do it in Adobe Camera Raw. So because I'm in Photoshop CC right now, I can press Control Shift and A, and that will bring me into Adobe Camera Raw. Um, that's a cool hot key to get you into Adobe Camera Raw. It's the same thing as going to Filter and going to Camera Raw. Control Shift A, I can just do it a lot faster that way. But in here, this is also in Lightroom. Now, I don't want to confuse a lot of people and say, oh, I don't have Camera Raw. Well, Lightroom is pretty much the same thing in the Develop module. So if you go over to the Lens Correction tab, right here where it says Color, you've got this button that says remove chromatic aberration. Sometimes just clicking that will remove the chromatic aberration. Other times you actually have to move the, the defringing here in the purple and the green. And then if there's, if you can, if you know the hue of the, of the chromatic aberration that you're working with, you can change this hue slider to match it exactly. And basically what this does is it shifts all the colors in your image slightly so that it fixes those hues of those chromatic aberration to make it almost non-existent. Basically it turns those colors into either black, a version of black, or white. Or what you can do also is if you don't know the color, a lot of times you can zoom in on an area. Oh, there might be a chromatic aberration right here. Let's see. And you can press the control button and click on that and it will automatically fix it. So yeah, that actually did. There is some chromatic aberration right there in the bridge. So sometimes just control clicking on that color where you see chromatic aberration, I'll zoom in a little closer. That's about as close as I can get. But there's a little purple there. If I control click that, Camera Raw is going to run all of its, you know, fun little algorithms and say, okay, that was a chromatic aberration, get rid of it. All right, we have one, time for one more question. This comes from Sam. He asks, is the order, is the order you apply the topaz filters important? Your workflow was adjust to clarity, to denoise, to detail, to impression. Is the order usually important to you? Yes, uh, order when it comes to workflow for me is extremely important, um, especially if you saw what I was doing there. So the first one was adjust. I was trying to extract as much dynamic range from this image to make it as close to an HDR image as I possibly could. So what I did was I used adjust to exploit that dynamic range that was in there to give me that. Then I used clarity to kind of refine all of the contrast in that image to get it closer to what I saw with my human eye. And then I used denoise because in that process, I, I made more noise than there would have been in the original file. So I had to fix that noise. And then I went to Topaz Detail and uh, kind of sharpened it up. That, and that typically, I know people say you should always sharp, you should always reduce the noise first and then you should sharpen later. Um, 
I don't really follow that rule 100%. I try to stay as strict to it as possible, but a lot of times when you use Topaz Detail, you're doing a lot of output sharpening. So in the process of getting the look that I wanted through the detail, I also sharpened up that image a little bit in the process. So um, I would stay pretty true to a workflow. If I were to use impression first, none of that stuff would have worked because I would have had a painting and I would have been doing a just on top of a painting instead of on top of the photo. Before, and really w the way I found impression to work the best is if you use it on a very contrasty image going into it. Sometimes I'll even boost the contrast way up. I mean, actually, that's what I'm doing with that poster edges. Um, when I use that poster edges filter, it's really heightening the contrast, making things really dark. So when I bring it into impression, I get a much better uh, output in the end because there's more for it to work with. If you work with an image that doesn't have a lot of contrast, you lose a lot. All right, good to know. Well, thank you so much for answering our audience's questions. Um, that's all we could get to today, so if you have any other questions, you can contact us at webinars at topazlabs.com.